Hello everybody, welcome back. This is Jonathan Gardner. We're going over the logic interlude, logic and mathematical expressions of basic mathematics by Sergey Lang. And this is section four, which talks about indices. Now, when I was teaching Singapore math to my children, we were using the algebra textbooks and they called indices the exponents. So they said like x to the three, the three is the index. This is what they said in Singapore math. Now, Singapore math, I believe, is the uh, English or British system, so they're using the terminology there. In America, heck yeah, um, we call this an exponent. So this is not an index, this is an exponent for us Americans. Um, the index is this number on the bottom. This is the index that we call the index. Um, I think they call it subscript in the British system. I could be wrong. I didn't take math from any British professors and I studied math my entire life in America. So my only exposure to the British system is through Singapore math. So if there is any confusion with my Indian viewers or my British viewers or anybody else, let me know about the correct terminology. I will remake this video to explain how the terminology works between the two systems. Okay, now he introduces this topic this way. He says, let's start with this statement. Let X and Y B numbers. Okay? Um, so we do that a lot, right? And when we say this, it could be x equals y. It could be that x doesn't equal y. We haven't said anything about the relationship between these two numbers, right? We also do things like let p and q be points. So in the next chapter, we'll be going into analytic, no, not analytic geometry, intuitive geometry. Uh, analytic geometry comes later. Analytic geometry is using numbers to describe geometry, and intuitive geometry is using shapes to describe geometry. So when we say this, also, P could be equal to Q. These could be the same points, or they may not be the same points. We haven't said enough to let you know whether or not that's true. So you have to think that they could be the same numbers and the same points. However, when we say something like X and Y be distinct numbers, There's a good word to know, distinct. This means that x cannot equal y. They have to be different numbers. They can't be the same number. Same for points. So we could restate this as let x and y be numbers such that x doesn't equal y. It means the same thing. Same thing for p, q, b, points such that p does not equal q. Then that's how we do that. Now, we start doing some more complicated math. We say, let x, y, and z be numbers. And here we haven't said anything about the relationship. So maybe x equals z or x equals y. Who knows, right? Um, but the problem is, is eventually you'll be doing math with more than 26 numbers. And you could go to the Greek letters, which uh, our ancestors did. So, um, Or you could uh, start using an, another language. You could use Chinese characters, I imagine, but who wants to learn Chinese to do math? So instead, what we do is we say, let x1, x2, x3 be numbers. Okay? Now, what does this say about the relationship of these three numbers? It, they could be the same, they could be different. These are just naming conventions. So when you see a subscript, it's just a new name, right? And you can put any kind of number down there. And, and you can even say like x sub a, where 1 um, is less than a is less than or equal to 4, and a is an integer, right? So, you know, this would be, so you have x1, x2, x3, and x4 in this case, right? So you might see a letter standing in for the subscript there. That happens too. Um, Oftentimes, these numbers are related in some way. They could be uh, components of a vector, for instance, or it could be, um, you know, you could have uh, a matrix where these numbers are the rows or columns in that matrix. So it's oftentimes that we do that. And um, so sometimes you'll see this notation where it says x1 dot 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 xn, right? And what this is saying is this is like a set or a sequence of numbers uh, I don't know how big n is. If it's 100, then there's 100 of these things in there. If it's 1,000, there's 1,000 of these things. If there's two, there's just two in there, right? So it depends on what n is. Um, you, if, you, if you studied uh, chemistry at all, you'll know that when you're studying the electron's valence, this is the kind of notation you'll see people using there. 
So, um, and, and they would say like xj is one of these numbers where a 1 is less than or equal to j, is less than or equal to n, and j is an int. It's assumed that when it's a subscript, it's an integer, right? So we don't have to do so much about that. Um, so for instance, we could say that xj is defined to be minus 1 to the jth power. And so x1 would be what? That would be minus 1 to the first power, which is just minus 1. x2 would be minus 1 to the second power, which is just 1. And x3 is equal to minus 1 to the third power, which is just minus 1. And x4 is equal to minus 1 to the fourth power, which is just 1. And you can see there's a pattern here, where when the, sub the subscript is, is odd, it's negative 1. And when the subscript is even, it's positive 1. And so you'll actually see these subscripts being used in formulas to describe how the numbers relate together. You'll also often see this, and as an example, he gives us, he says, we have a sequence, a polynomial, such that a n x to the n plus a to the n minus 1 times x to the n minus 1 plus dot 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 plus a 0. Okay? And what this says is we have n elements where if we had like let's say five elements, the first one would be a5 x to the fifth power plus and the next one would be a4 x to the fourth power and the next one would be a3 to the x to the third power plus a squared x to the second power plus a to the one x to the first power, but x to the first power is just x, so we just write x. And then we finally have a zero. Okay, so zero is a valid subscript as well. Note that if we did x to the zero power, that would just be one, so we just leave it out together. So this is a shorthand for that, and, and sometimes you'll have polynomials that go on to hundreds and hundreds and stuff like that. So, um, And so we would consider, in such a case, the polynomial, the coefficients, uh, in some kind of sequence like this. And we would actually be able to solve this by just examining these things and doing some magic with it, which you will learn about later. Um, so if we had, for instance, a sequence um, minus 5 in the book, 4, minus 2, and 4, that would represent 4x um, to the fourth power plus minus 2x to the third power plus 4x to the second power. No, I did this wrong, didn't I? Um, let's start over. 4x to the third power, because this would be a sub 0, and this would be a sub 3. So it's x to the third power. And then we have minus 2x squared plus 4x minus 5. That is what this sequence of number represents if this is the representation of what that sequence means. All right, that's about all there is to say about indices. We will be doing a lot more with indices when we actually start to use them, which is going to come a little sooner than you realize. I don't know we use much in Chapter 4, but we do use it in Chapter 5 um, because we're dealing with two-dimensional or three-dimensional objects, and so we don't know if we have two or three items in the sequence. Anyway, guys, thanks for watching. Take care, and bye-bye. Hey guys, thanks for watching this video. This video is part of my series on Sergey Lang's basic mathematics. You can click here to watch the rest of the videos in the playlist. You can click here to learn more about me, and you can click here to support my channel. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.